You're listening to the Sound Words STL Podcast. Hi, I'm Sarah Thompson for SoundWordsSTL.com, coming to you from the St. Louis room at Blueberry Hill, and I'm joined now by recording artist Brian Owens. Brian, thanks so much for being here. You're looking around. Thanks for having cool me. Room. I guess I'm, I'm realizing why they call it the St. Louis room. We need to get your photo up here. Your photo <laughs> actually might be up here. No, it's not. No. <laughs> no. No. So I think the last time I saw you was in earlier this year. You were performing with Peter uh, Martin and Terrence Blanchard, and that was really great to see you at the Grandel. That was fun. That was fun. That was yeah, a very cool night. How was that to have Terrence Blanchard there? He's ridiculous. Yeah. No pressure. <laughs> you you were awesome. It was a great night. It was. I was really sick good. though. Were you? Oh, that's right. I remember you saying that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it was, was fun though. It, you know, singers always have an excuse. <laughs> when they don't feel like they performed at their hundred percent, it's like, right. yeah, I'm getting over a cold. You know, need a little bit more rest. It was fun though. I had a, I had a really good time though. Yeah, it was a great night. I think yeah. a lot of people enjoyed that. So we're gonna kind of get into things. Uh, talking about your latest album, Soul of Cash, which originally came out last year and it was recently released on vinyl. All but one song on that album is a Johnny Cash cover. But you take a classic soul approach to these songs, which were originally very different. So what gave you the idea to do a record like this? So I think it was probably 2014. I did a, you know, I had this series that I was calling the Master Series that I was doing at the Sheldon, where I was covering all of my favorite soul artists. And somehow Johnny Cash found his way into the mix of Ray Charles, Otis Redding, Sam Cooke, Marvin Gaye. Um, I still don't know how. Um, but uh, to me, I'd come to the conclusion that, well, you know, Johnny Cash, is a, he, he very much is a soul artist. I was getting into a lot of his music, connected with him on a, on a faith level, just on his faith and his journey and that struggle in his life. And so I did a Johnny Cash show, and there are a couple songs that I knew I was going to struggle with because my voice is not as low as his. So this is like, like not, even, not even joking, like in the show, we get to walk the line, and I'm like, I still don't know how I'm going to do it because it goes so low. So it's like, oh, okay, let's try this. It's like, you guys have heard of CMT Crossroads to the audience. It's like, yeah, it's like, so you know, most of my heroes have already passed away, and I won't get a chance to do it with them. But I wonder what it would be like if I got a chance to do a Crossroads with Johnny Cash. So I sang Walk the Line as him and as me. And then every time I sang it as me, I just sang it the octave up. So I cheated going down the octave. Mm-hmm. And someone came up to me after the show and said that was their favorite part of the show, was hearing me sing Johnny Cash as me. I was like, oh, okay. So then for the next two years, I started experimenting with arrangements. I went down to Lexington, Kentucky uh, with a couple of my friends down there, Lee Carroll and um, Dwayne Lundy, and we started playing around with that concept. Like, could I take these Cash tunes and do them uh, in a soul style? Which is not that absurd, seeing as how one of the greatest country albums of all time was done by Ray Charles. Um, um, uh, who else did soul stuff uh, that did country? I mean, we, Nat King Cole had a country album. Sam Cooke covered uh, Tennessee Waltz. So, I mean, it's not outside the realm of possibility that a soul singer would cover country music. Um, so that's how it happened. I mean, it just started flowing out of that, and it was almost like a two-year process. To the, we got to the point where we actually were recording what is now the Soul of Cash. Got it. That's interesting. That's really interesting. And there's one song that's not actually a cover um, on in Soul uh, Soul in My Country, and it's a collaboration with Robert Randolph. Uh, so what was it like working with him? It was pretty dope. I mean, he's he's phenomenal, and I have footage of us in the studio. I just haven't <laughs> I haven't I haven't put it out, but it's just us vibing in the studio, him playing. I mean, he's phenomenal. He's like. It's a whole nother level of of musicianship that he has. Um, growing up playing in church and playing Sacred Steel and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the, but the, the song was written, co-written by and the young lady that's singing on her name is Reese Palmer. And Reese and I met through my manager and her attorney. And come to find out, she's from Eureka. I didn't even know that. Huh. So like it was really it was it was it's a 
it's a song that was kind of born out of people's re- response and reaction to me when I would tell them I'm doing a Johnny Cash record. And it kind of looked like, you can imagine, look, this is a podcast, so you can't see my face. <laughs> but you can imagine the look that people would give to a, you know, six foot one, skinny little black dude with a beard, you know, like Marvin Gaye saying, I'm going to do a Johnny Cash record. And it's like, oh, how's that going to work? Okay, well, okay, well. Might be interested in hearing that, maybe <laughs> that kind of stuff. So, um, but yeah, I mean, like folks like Robert and um, Daru Jones played with Jack White on the album. Marcus Machado out of New York. I mean, they brought they they really helped to bring a definitive soul vibe that did not negate Johnny Cash's original structure of the tunes. So we wanted to write something that was kind of in that same vein, but that was also an explanation of why we did the record. Um, another great you got to work with was Michael McDonald on your 2017 song for you. Uh, you've become friends, and I would imagine the fact that since you're both from Ferguson, Missouri, that has helped build the relationship. And I mean, Michael McDonald, he's one of the most recognizable, you know, still oh, yeah. performances. Talk about that. I mean, it's a blessing, man. It's really dope to, to, to have a relationship with him and be able to have gotten a tour a couple times with him and perform with him um, when he came here and played at the... At, uh, at the Peabody, my father and I, you know, performed with him, did The Change Is Gonna Come, and then I did some some other stuff with him. Um, and it's interesting because his son, Dylan, who in his own right is a really talented singer, songwriter, um, is on the cash record. So we do a cover of uh, Long Black Veil as a duet, and it's it's killing. And he doesn't sound anything like it. He doesn't sound anything like his dad. Really? What is he Yeah. Like? Well, he says he sounds like his mom, who, who his mom is a is a is another like really talented you know writer and singer. Um, but it was cool. It was cool. To, it's cool to have recorded with both of them. Yeah, Cause I'm looking at it, Michael McDonald's photos. Yeah, right it's because it's like it's like yeah yeah yeah. 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 I mean, he's so very different. To, I mean, did you feel like you connected over? Over Ferguson, both being from there, is that even? Does how does that? I mean, we met so when everything went down in Ferguson, we did a concert on the parking lot of the church that I was attending at the time, and his best friend, um, Dave, uh, Dan Duncan, and his wife Dana, they still live in, Fer- in the Ferguson area, so they were at that concert, and that's how it all started, because yeah. he was Michael's coming to town next year, the the, the year after, and so we should get Brian to open, and mm-hmm. the rest is history. All right, well, speaking on, along that same line, so that song, For You, appears on your previous album, Soul of Ferguson, and there seems to be a bit of a trend with the album names. So will you do another no, theme no, or concept no. album like these two next? I'm not, no, my next album would not be a soul of. I think I'm sold out. Um, <laughs> that was really corny. Um, <laughs> that no, was a good one. Yeah, which I'm, I'm actually, I'm getting ready, I'm doing pre-production for my next record now, and I'm really really excited about it um so it but it won't be a soul of no okay it was fun like i mean i think it was cool like doing the soul of ferguson and the soul of cash and one day release it as like a little box set thing and have a big you know like four disc vinyl set and and all that kind of stuff but yeah I'm, i'm 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 cool on the soul of You've been so involved with the St. Louis community, and I mean, I think a lot of people know you for your community involvement just as much, obviously, with your music. Um, and you've even written a song for Cardinals legend Bob Gibson. That's quite an honor. Here's the thing, though. I didn't write it. My students wrote it. Okay. Which, well, is, even, which is even better for me. <laughs> I'm like, man, that's awesome. So, and his picture's right there, Bob Gibson. Um, so the Cardinals approached the symphony, who then approached Adam Manis who's with the 442s, and they wanted him to, in celebration of Bob Gibson's 50, it's the 50th anniversary of his 1968 season where he completely crushed everybody in baseball, and the next season they lowered the mile five inches, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's not like he was a stud or anything. <laughs> um, and so they approached him about doing a song in the style of Hamilton to celebrate, you know, Bob Gibson. So Adam called us, because we had just finished this uh, Wrapped and Remix project with the Symphony and Life Arts, and... Um, yeah, he called us up. He's like, yo, we, you know, maybe getting this project with the Cardinals. Love to have the students involved in writing all the lyrics. So, like, the students wrote it. I mean, I might have thrown in a hook, but that was it. That's right. The students wrote it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, that's really neat. So it's hard to keep track of the causes you're tied to because there are so many. And the Ferguson Youth Initiative is one that seems dear to you. Can you talk about the work that organization does? I mean, they're awesome, and they were in Ferguson before 2014. And I think a lot of people make the mistake of assuming that pre uh, pre Michael Brown, there was nothing going on in Ferguson that was, you know. Uh, focused in on helping to develop and help youth and offset um, social justice things. Um, and the Ferguson Youth Initiative was definitely something that was doing that. And I know it firsthand because my na- my former neighbor, who she since passed away, and now we live in her, ha- her house, uh, Gail Babcock, she was instrumental in starting the Ferguson Youth Initiative. And she's how I came to know who they were. So when we did that park that parking lot concert in 2014, it was to benefit, raise money, and get volunteers for the Ferguson Youth Initiative. They do great work. Yeah, um, talk about the yeah. Work so they they do. They, do um, uh, they have several programs that you can find about about online, mm-hmm. um, where they get you know kids can get bikes, kids can get computers. Um, they have a back bay where they do uh, spoken word nights and different things like that, um, just to keep students engaged. Um, they have leadership opportunities for students to be engaged with the civic government. Um, they have a program where, where students can um, work off their fines, um, do community service as opposed to having to pay them. So, I mean, it's, it's a great organization. When people talk about where they can, where they can put their money or their time in, in, in Ferguson, I think that's one of the best investments you can make is into the Ferguson Youth Initiative. Well, we're talking so much about kids and a running theme through all these causes is that you're so involved with teaching kids music and even recording and performing with them, which you've kind of just alluded to. You Obviously, you're a father, too. Why is it so important to you in terms of working with kids? I mean, it's the only investment that's eternal to me. I mean, you know, the whole idea for me of when, when Jesus talks about storing up for yourself treasure in heaven, not treasure on earth. Um, I think the investment into people and their souls is the only thing that really lasts. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I can buy my kids a house and that won't make it. But if I invest into their souls, I get to see them on the other side. And, and, and that's, to me, it's what impo- what's important with all of our students is discipling them to, to be eternal livers. <laughs> you know, like, that's, that's the whole point. And music is a great platform, music and arts and tech. Right now, media, it's a great platform to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. I think that's a really, do you think that's something that came, has always been in you, that sort of vision to do that? Or do you think it was becoming a father to really made you see that? I mean, I think it's a couple of things. I mean, for me as a follower of Jesus, it's like disciple making is like, it's not optional. Like, and then being a father, it's like mentorship is not optional. It's like, it's all, it's all in there. And, you know, generally speaking, you're always working with the generations that are, that are behind you so that you can bring them along and, and position them to do the same thing. So um, I would say it was it's supernaturally natural. Like it's not something that like I woke up when I was 15 and I was like, man, I got to burn the desire to work with kids. <laughs> you know you know what I'm saying? It was like as I got older, God was like, yeah, yeah you know, this is, this is kind of what you need to do, right? right? Like you know that this is... And then so the way that my career started to shift from me wanting to be famous to me wanting to invest in people's legacy, you know, from me wanting, man, it'd be great to, like, you know, do this so I have all this money to do, to to give back and pour into. And he's like, well, you got a lot of time right now. Why don't you start there? And maybe we can talk about the money on the back end. You know, so now I feel like I'm at a place where I actually understand what all the stuff is for. I understand what platforms and what resources and what... You know, all those things should be used for. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna mm. use them on myself. Now you're listening to. You gotta listen to that. To that. You know, not yeah. just your own passion. So I don't get the. I don't get the Bentley. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like I. Like I don't. I don't get that the you're Bentley. Is you know is tremendous in so many ways, and uh, you know along those same lines are kind of shifting. You have a Christmas concert coming up on December 8th. Is that right? At Salem yeah, United Salem United Methodist, Methodist yeah. Church. So, uh-huh. so like, I mean, this is a busy holiday season for me. I'm usually not this busy, but um, so December 8th, I'm really excited about that concert. It's kind of like a, you know, soul of the season kind of thing um, with the, the chamber orchestra out there and Steve Morton and the chamber singers. And um, it's going to be a really cool concert. Adam Manish Trio. Um, I'm going to have Jamal Nichols from uh, the Gregory Porter Band, who's from St. Louis, 
uh, with us on bass. Um, one of my students, Melina Smith, who is an up-and-coming artist, is going to be, be on the program. And then the crazy thing is that, like, so the, the 16th and 17th of December, right down the street from where we are now. Mm-hmm. If you don't if you don't know, we're, we're at the Duck Room. No, we're at the Blueberry Hill. Yeah, we're in the St. Louis Room. Where the Duck Blueberry Room is, yes. which I should go look at. In the um, Del Mar Loop. Yeah, in the Del Mar Loop, yeah. In the St. Louis Room. <laughs> um, so if you want to come down. Um, so down the street at 560 Trinity, we do, uh, these, the last you know three years, we've done a thing called the Holiday Spectacular with the 442s and Peter Martin and um, you know Christine Brewer this year. and It's like Aaron Bodie. It's like we're all like this, all this cast of friends. So this year we're doing two nights, the six, the 17th and the 18th, I think it is. Uh-huh. Don't kill me, Bjorn. Um, I think it's the 17th and the 18th. It's the Monday and Tuesday. Uh-huh. Uh, and I'm really I'm really excited about that show, too. So it's just, probably going to be a wide selection of Oh, Christmas man, yeah. Like it's that. it's a great show. I mean, both. like the, So December 8th is, is me getting to, you know, really kind of do what I did last year when I filled in for Diane Reeves uh-huh. um, at Powell Hall and really explore um, – Explore the arena of sing. I love singing with orchestras. Mm-hmm. I love it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you know, on the seventeenth and eighteenth, I get to, you know, do the same kind of thing with arguably you know the best musicians in the city. So yeah. December's a good month. It's a fun <laughs> month for me musically. Every month's got to be a good month if you're you know being you. So, um, and once again, the latest LP, Soul of Cash, is available now. Congratulations on that. And does it make it? even more special to have it out on wax vinyl is the bomb like the way it sounds on vinyl to me is so beautiful it's so warm these songs the arrangements um i think we were definitely recording it with that in mind all of my vocals were done on an rca like an old rca mic and it, it it really translates and comes across um so yeah i'm 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 excited about it being on vinyl. We're all we're out of the first press, so we're gonna be looking to do a second press on it. Uh, but yeah, it's it's been a it's been an interesting year in a good way. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens. We just put it in for potential Grammy nominations, so hopefully it'll get you'll get some good consideration. Congratulations! Uh, yeah, That's people fantastic. always congratulate you, you when you tell them when, when, it, when you tell them <laughs> no. Like I just put it in. It has to go through a whole process of. You know, people saying, oh, yeah, they should vote on it. <laughs> but I think to have, I think you know, so many people, you know, you're very beloved, you know, in St. Louis. And I think for people to see your star continue to rise, even in something like this, to submit for a nomination is, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. So congratulations. <laughs> so once again, congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. Like, <laughs> I'll say it again when you get the nomination, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be dope, though. Thank you so much, Brian Owens, for joining us. And for more about our guest today, visit com. For SoundWordsSTL.com, I'm Sarah Thompson. Thanks for listening to the SoundWords STL podcast. 